it was very literal in the Roman Empire. People actually were thrown to the lions. Have you ever wondered what it would have been like to live under one of the most corrupt and vicious leaders of the Roman Empire? Nero is often considered by many to be one of the most tyrannical emperors in Rome's history due to the major role he played in the persecution of Christians. But what exactly drove the man to become so evil? Join us on this historical expedition as we journey back to the rise of one of ancient Rome's most powerful leaders to discuss why Nero was known as such a wicked ruler and how everything he had accomplished in his reign eventually came crashing down around him. This is a video you won't want to miss. The early life of Emperor Nero. Nero was born on December 15th, 37 AD, and given the name Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, Lucius's father passed away when he was still a young child, but he left behind a vast wealth and estate for his son, a fortune Lucius would never inherit, as it was later confiscated by the Emperor Caligula. Lucius would later change his name to Nero after he was adopted at the age of 13 by Agrippa the Younger and the then Roman Emperor Claudius, who had replaced Caligula at the young age of 16, he succeeded his stepfather after his mysterious death and became the next emperor of Rome. Nero was the fifth and last ruler of the Julio-Claudian dynasty and his reign lasted from AD 54 until AD 68. During the initial stages of his rule, Nero was considered a popular ruler. He had many powerful friends in the Praetorian Guard and even the lower class citizens of Rome considered him a kind and approachable emperor. There were lavish games, concerts, plays, chariot races, and tax reductions, all of which gave him the reputation of a great ruler. On the other hand, many of the aristocrats of the era deeply resented the young emperor, but Nero took it on his chest and lived by the old saying, you can't please everyone. However, he would soon prove the aristocracy correct, as it wasn't long until Nero's true colors began to show. A few years into his reign, his tyrannical side emerged and he became increasingly paranoid, one factor that would lead him to commit two horrible crimes. Nero's paranoia began to take over, and he had horrid nightmares of being overthrown by his younger stepbrother, Britannicus. Writers of the era have suggested that Agrippa was a malicious and power-hungry woman who wanted control over her stepson. She likely played into his paranoia and convinced Nero to poison his 13-year-old brother one evening as they had dinner, if we believe the legends. This story was backed up by the scholar Tacitus, who claims Nero had his brother poisoned so he could not make any kind of claim towards the throne. While you may be thinking what would possess a man to do such a thing, this was not even his most heinous crime. According to three writers of the era, Nero would later organize the assassination of his mother, Agrippina. Around five years into his rule, Nero and his mother became stuck in a brutal struggle for power, so much so that the young emperor decided to sink her boat as she journeyed to a party one evening, hoping she would die in the quote-unquote accident. When Agrippa figured out about the plot on her life, she was prepared and managed to swim to shore. Rumors have it that Nero planned a second attempt on his stepmother's life by simply ordering a former slave to stab her to death in AD 59. Following the assassination, Nero was congratulated by many high-ranking officials surrounding him, further adding to his already inflated ego. Once he had killed his brother and mother, you may have thought that there was no way he could do anything more horrendous. Well, you'd be wrong. Nero had married his wife Claudia Octavia, a woman respected for her virtues and moral standards. But Nero soon grew bored of his wife and even tried to strangle it to death at one point. Unfortunately, Claudia could not bear the emperor a child, so there would be no heir to his throne, an idea Nero couldn't stand. So he began sleeping around and eventually impregnated a free woman named Poppea Sabina. Nero decided that he would divorce Octavia, banish her from Rome, and marry Poppea instead. But this didn't go down well with the citizens of Rome. Everyone loved Octavia and took to the streets to demand her safe return to the empire. They carried busts through the streets and the crowds grew to such a size that Nero actually began to contemplate remarrying Octavia just to keep the citizens happy. Ultimately, he did the next best thing in his mind. He decided he would partake in a traditional Roman suicide ritual, a tradition that he hoped would instill fear and show off his true leadership skills. As we move forward, don't be left in the ruins of Rome. Press subscribe and keep up with Nero's reign. Nero persecutes the Christians. While there is an endless list of horrible crimes committed by the slightly insane emperor, one of Nero's greatest crimes was his persecution of the Christian peoples. 
religious groups were persecuted on numerous occasions throughout the long history of the Roman Empire. However, some would consider Nero the first to really go out of his way to make life a living hell for Christians. He didn't just kill the followers of God, he tortured them with a smile on his face, so much so that many would begin to consider him the first Antichrist. Nero's hatred for Christians began following one of the most devastating events that ever struck the Roman Empire, the Great Fire of Rome. In 64 AD, the fire had lit up two-thirds of Rome, killed hundreds, left thousands more homeless, and destroyed some of Rome's greatest architecture, including the Temple of Jupiter Stator and the House of the Vestals. When it came time to point fingers, Nero decided that it was the Christians' fault. He proclaimed that this was why the Roman gods bestowed a great misfortune on the empire. Nero began exiling a large portion of the Christians from Rome, and those who stayed behind would suffer a much worse fate at the hands of the psychotic ruler. As many Christians living in Rome were foreigners, poor, and harmless, the Romans already had a strong dislike for them by Nero's era. Nero would use the religious group as a scapegoat after the Great Fire had destroyed over two-thirds of the city. Not long after the catastrophic event, many people began questioning whether or not the emperor had a hand in starting the fire because of his immediate plans to build a new, lavish palace. Nero soon took his opportunity and began blaming the Christians for all the unfortunate events that came to fruition during his rule. This was even confirmed in the annals of Tacitus, which read, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. A great purge of Christians in the empire was now underway. Nero began by torturing any Christian he could get his hands on. Many were thrown to lions or torn about by hounds. Others were nailed to crosses and left to die in the open. But worst of all, some were set aflame and left to burn like a bonfire until the next sunrise a twisted and heinous crime. Nero made it clear that he hated Christians and made it his personal mission to eradicate as many of them as he could, all while using them as an excuse for the rapidly declining state of the empire under his rule. According to ancient tradition, two biblical figures, Peter and Paul, also died during this first official Roman persecution of the Christians. Peter was crucified, whereas Paul, a Roman citizen, had the privilege of being beheaded rather than crucified. Nero's hatred grew so much for the followers of God that he created a circus named Neronius, where various acts of entertainment took place. Here, spectators could enjoy chariot racing, Olympic-style games, and of course, the persecution of Christians in front of a wide audience. Mass executions would occur in the center of the arena, and even some Roman citizens would watch on with horror. During these events, Nero mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. But it was becoming increasingly apparent in the minds of many Roman citizens that even the so-called criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment in the eyes of their emperor were merely used to glut one man's cruelty. Throughout this horrid period, Christians began using code in their letters to refer to the evil emperor and his empire. The followers of Jesus started calling the empire Babylon instead of Rome. This was one way the Christians could record what was going on during their persecution without the information leading to their deaths. The crimes committed against the followers of Christianity by Nero raised him to a higher position than anyone else in the pantheon of Christian persecutors. He wasn't just an evil or vicious man in the eyes of the Christians. He was the incarnation of the Antichrist. The End of Nero's Rule Under Nero's rule, it appeared that the empire was beginning to collapse in on itself. The bloodshed on Christians had given him the reputation of a psychotic killer. The rebuilding of Rome forced him to devalue the imperial currency by 10%, and revolts in Britain and Judea were getting out of control. It was at this point that Nero's paranoia began to run rampant again. He believed that an assassination attempt on his life was imminent, so he started doing what he thought best in true Nero fashion. He had various members of the Senate killed, and anyone he imagined was against him. With extreme unrest growing in the city, Nero took a short break to Greece, where he remained for 15 months. The city had not changed when he finally returned to Rome in 66 AD. Mass unrest still covered the streets, and it seemed that the Senate had had enough of his incapacity to govern the empire. Nero had failed to respond to a major uprising in Gaul, and this was the last straw for the Senate. Nero was now considered an enemy of the people and the empire. 
everything Nero had done as the emperor was now falling to pieces, and he had lost the support of the Roman people. Nero decided that the only thing he could do at this point was to make a run for it and flee the city. Nero masked himself in disguise and traveled to a friend's villa on the outskirts of the city. However, he was followed, and soon soldiers arrived at the home. In a frantic panic, Nero attempted to commit suicide, but failed. He then requested his friend finish the job, which he did successfully. On the 9th of June, 68 AD, Nero was announced dead. Unfortunately for the Roman Empire, Nero's death did not bring about the peace or security they had hoped for. Instead, it brought about one of the most turbulent periods in the history of the empire, known as the Year of the Four Emperors. A succession of military commanders fought each other for the imperial throne, and the empire was condemned to more death, chaos, and uncertainty than it had been in previous years. We've navigated Nero's reign. Enjoyed it? Like, share, subscribe to Magma Storm. Which historical figures should we delve into next? Let us know in the comments. Thanks, and stay tuned for more.